Uh, good evening or good afternoon and uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our March 17, 2020 special meeting of the Daytona Beach City Commission. Um, I would ask Ms. LaMagna at this time for a roll call. Commissioner Traeger? Here. Commissioner Delgado? Commissioner May? Here. Commissioner Gilliland? Here. Commissioner Henry? Here. Commissioner Reed? Here. Mayor Derek L. Henry? Here. Second. second. Take a motion from Commissioner uh, De Gilliland and take a second from Commissioner Traeger. Uh, Madam Clerk. Okay. Do all those yes. in favor? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> motion. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those in opposition, same sign. Uh, motion carries 6-0. Okay. We're going to move on to item three. And as you can see tonight, we're going to do things a little differently. Um, if you want to speak on this item, which is item number three, which is the declaring a state of emergency, we're just going to have individuals line up at the podium, and then we'll take you as first come, first serve. Yeah, I, have, I have a question mm -hmm. before we get started here. So there's this, uh, I think it was the amended declaration of a local <laughs> state of emergency and executive order that's signed by the mayor and the manager yesterday. Then we have the, there's conflicting information from the governor's executive order from today. Mm -hmm. And then we have this resolution for uh, declaring a state of emergency and providing when this resolution shall take effect. So how many things are we voting on here tonight? What, what's going, what's the, how do these things connect? Because I got some problems with the, yeah. the bar, the, uh, the bar restaurant or the bar pub stuff or nightclub is now basically closed. But some of these restaurant restrictions in my mind are overly restrictive. So how do we, we're, we're in this process. Are we gonna have a discussion about what is the appropriate balance between the public health need and the economic need of the of the community? I'll be glad to try to connect those dots just from a you know, organizational standpoint as it's uh, set up <clears throat> the statutes and and our own ordinances and the city charter. So uh, basically the way this whole process works um, as approved by your emergency management plan or, or program um, is that the mayor has authority <clears throat> to make the declaration of a local state of emergency and to is ex issue executive orders to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the citizenry uh, pursuant to the authority provided by the city commission. So today, what we're here for is to provide that authority to the mayor and to authorize his previous actions. Uh, the authority you provide by your resolution is to ratify or approve the mayor's declaration. So you have the choice today to approve it or not approve it. Um, and I know from talking to the mayor that there will be some changes tonight to the amended declaration that was presented on Friday um, because of changes to the CDC guidelines and also because of the most recent executive order this afternoon from the governor. So, so that's where we're at. Does that answer the questions? Um, uh, I think um, if we're going to make changes to his executive, I mean, to his declaration, it probably ought to be something that's discussed with with the board and that should happen before we adopt you know it the sounds resolution. like if we don't agree with what was put into place yesterday right. we have to vote against the declaration today which i'd rather not do I, but i mean if we yeah. can but you can modify i think you can modify it here well, commissioner the, well it, it's the mayor's yeah. authority to do this so the, he would you know I, I i just i think we should talk a little bit about it now that now that the governor's order has come out and it's placed restrictions on restaurants that were not in yesterday's order that you signed, mm -hmm. um, but you know there are also some things in there that are more restrictive than what the what the governor's put into place. Right. I, I would agree. Your authority today is to either approve the state of emergency or not. It's the mayor that has the authority to issue the executive orders to protect the health, safety, safety and welfare. Your is yours is essentially a veto power on that authority through approving the declaration of emergency. Uh, but I would I would agree with your suggestion that we work out any details for the declaration so you can move forward with the approving uh, the overall declaration. So we'll look at really the executive order portion of the declaration to make sure that you're in agreement. And if so, you would approve the state of local emergency. So if we're not in agreement, we'll have to come back and it'll have to be redone and we'll have to come back and vote again? If you vote it down, then 
yes, we could come back and do it again. But if we or come we to could come to some agreement and then right. move forward. Right. Just as long here. as we come to an agreement tonight about what should transpire. Okay. I mean, I obviously, would, we have to, like in the restaurant front, we have to do the, you know, groups of no more than 10, uh, groups separated by at least six feet, things that were in the governor's order today that right. were in yesterday's order right. that the mayor signed. Mm -hmm. right, but so I we, do, I do want to revisit the uh, the hours piece of it because you know, the the effect this is having on our local economy is is devastating, and I don't think you know I I, I would like to hear what everybody else thinks whether or not the uh, we need to have that additional restriction um, with the hours, particularly you know not all these places are the same. A place like a Pizza Hut or a Papa John's that's only doing delivery has to close at 10 o'clock based on the way the, the, the order is written, where I don't think that we want to really modify their hours at all. Um, you know, I also don't know that, you know, uh, uh, 10 o'clock is necessarily the right, the, the right ending time. Um, I don't think we should be any later than 12, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing what's happening in the community and it is between schools being closed for an additional week and then being virtual after that, um, a lot of people that didn't get to work in, in Daytona, you know, the people who worked in Ormond and New Smyrna Saturday night made tons of money. People working in Daytona didn't make anything. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was unfortunate that we were the only ones who went out there and did something related to, to bike week. But I, you know, I think it's something we need to make sure that we're all comfortable with this balance because this is a very serious public health problem that we're trying to appropriately manage but there's also a very serious economic problem that we need to make sure we aren't exacerbating by being perhaps too heavy handed on the, on the public health side. We, should we hear from people who want to speak first? Or I mean, like. You want to you, hear speakers first? Or uh, might want to get what Please? exactly you're going to. Well, I guess they won't know what we're voting on if we don't discuss it or where we stand. Okay. Um, okay. So let's go through it because uh, <coughs> I understand the sentiments. Um, Shall we go through uh, mm -hmm. the executive order portion mm -hmm. of the declaration in section four, line by line, and, and sure. see where we're at? Um, if you'd like, I'll walk us through that. Mm -hmm. All right, so section four. It says at all times while the declaration of a local state of emergency is in effect, the following emergency measures to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 shall apply throughout the city. Uh, number, or letter A rather. Mm -hmm. um, and this was in the prior uh, executive order portion. Uh, the city suspending all of its program for senior citizens at city facilities. I assume there's no conversation regarding that from the commission. All right. Uh, B is a change which, um, Mayor and I talked about it, and, and I'll go through that. But uh, B deals with canceling events at city parks and facilities of more than 100. The CDC's current recommendation is 10, and so to be consistent with the CDC, that number should be reduced to 10. Um, so should we kind of, each one of these where there's going to be a change, should we kind of stop and make sure that everybody's yeah. okay with that? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree. I think we should follow yeah. the CDC, um, you know, uh, guidance. All right. And, and that guidance has changed since this was drafted. Yes. Um, so uh, D is a similar change. Uh, D. Or um, C. I'm sorry, C. I'm sorry, C, yes. Um, C was revised uh, recently to say consistent with CD CDC guidelines uh, for the COVID-19 outbreak. The next eight, for the next eight weeks, organizers are strongly encouraged to post or postpone or counsel in-person events with, and the change was 50, or more eventual individuals anticipated to be in attendance. Again, that change that should be changed to 10 instead of 50 based on the most recent guidelines. Mm -hmm. Any controversy there? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, letter D has to deal with bike week. That's obviously passed. Uh, letter E indicates the city is suspending issuance of new outdoor events permits. Um, I assume there's no controversy regarding that. All right. Letter F, these are new uh, executive orders established by the mayor. Letter F states that all bars, nightclubs, and restaurants are mandated to close for business daily at or before 10 p.m. and remain closed until at least 6 a.m. the following day. 
and uh, in response to Commissioner <coughs> Gilman, we could easily draft in an exception for deliveries. So um, I think we need to split bars and night bars, pubs, nightclubs out, and then just mimic the language that's in the uh, the governor's order. You know, um, which was fairly specific about. Uh, uh, sale of alcoholic beverages? Yeah, it's about the 50 percent. Yeah, so uh, a licensee authorized to sell alcoholic beverages for consumption on premises that derive more than 50 percent of its gross revenue from the sale of alcoholic beverages uh, shall be suspended at uh, 5 o'clock today. For how long? For 30 days. This is the, gov the governor's order. Okay. So I, I, think, I think splitting that out and just mimicking that language would simplify the, the conversation. We could do that. There are... There are some inconsistencies in, in the governor's executive mm -hmm. orders requirements. So, for instance, the regulation with regard to bars, pubs, and nightclubs uh, to suspend all alcohol sales does not address any sort of 50% occupancy limitation. So, arguably, bars, pubs, and nightclubs could have 100% yep. occupancy. So, the the executive order, as drafted by the mayor, uh, would provide for you know uniform 50% limitation on occupancy. So they could they could Bob? open but not serve anything. Was it occupancy or Does he uh, have a serving phone? alcohol? So there's two under under the executive order from the governor. There's mm -hmm. two basic requirements. One is for bars, and that limits the sale. Bob, of, can you pull your mic down? I'm sorry. That prevents the sale of alcohol for bars. The other requirement relates to restaurants, and that has a 50 percent occupancy limitation. So um, so it's arguably. The requirement for bars doesn't apply to restaurants and vice versa. So mm. bars could have 100% occupancy and restaurants could serve alcohol. So the solution, of course, would be to draft something which would apply uni uniformly to both bars and restaurants. So the bar part is they got to close at 5 o'clock today and they can't reopen. You know, I mean, they, they could, I mean, you're right, there's a loophole there that they wanted to open and let people in but not sell them anything. They would have the right to do that and be 100% occupied, which you're right, legally that is, would be allowed, which is a little absurd. Um, uh, but I'm not sure how you close that loop. Um, Can we add the number of people? Well, you, would, you could prevent alcohol sales at all bars and restaurants, one option for you, and you could limit occupancy at bars and restaurants to 50% to be consistent. So the governor's order suspends all alcohol, all the, all sale of alcoholic beverages for 30 days from the date of this order effective 5 o'clock today. Mm -hmm. Right. So that applies here regardless to what we do. Absolutely. They, starting an hour, no, 50 minutes ago, they can't sell alcohol. Correct. For but the they could people sell that have the that don't have like a restaurant license. So, <clears throat> um, you know, the, the restaurants... You know, you know, you know where I'm going to go with this. Yeah. I think we should follow the governor's. You know, you know, the, the, the CDC, the Department, Florida Department of Health, and the governor's office have put together this this thing of, you know, no more than 10 people in a group and group separated separated by six feet. You know, I think that is as restrictive as we need to be with with restaurants. Um, I don't know that we uh, uh, that we need to be, um, you know. The hours, uh, you know, are, is, a, is a bit troublesome for me. But then we do have a problem with we have places in town that have restaurant licenses that operate like bars. Open till two o'clock. And so I think that there, there needs to be an addition to that. That, for mm -hmm. example, your kitchen has to be open. Um, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you are, you know, operating under a restaurant license, um, you know, and if people are in there not eating, you know, in I'm not sure how we go about enforcing that, but it's, you know, it's our fault for allowing those places to stay open for so many years without having shut them down or required them to get the, get the right licensure. Now, I don't want, what I don't want to do is punish every other law-abiding restaurant in town because we've got a handful of these guys that are, you know, that are operating like bars when they under a restaurant license. Can I ask a question? Is the purpose in all of this to, uh, to mitigate the spread, obviously, right? Just right. to lessen it. So just decreasing the number of people congregating would accomplish that. So if you have a restaurant without alcohol, but people are still congregating, you still have a problem on your hands. The goal is just diminishing the numbers, correct? And spacing. And space. Correct. 
Uh, and so we're saying, I'm just curious, so you're saying we'd be okay, I'm just not that you're saying it, but the concept is we have somebody who allows for 100 people occupancy and they go down to let's say 50 with spreading distance, meaning there's six feet between each person or whatever, we would be okay with this versus just saying, look, let's not even go there. For, for a restaurant, for a is restaurant. what I'm saying. And that's what the, the governor's office is saying as well. Okay. I think that the, the bars and clubs is, is a different conversation than the restaurants. So right. I was trying to kind of separate the two to say, I think we kind of recognize that the bars are clo should be closed now and mm -hmm. not reopened for, for 30 days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, I, all, we all agree to that. But are we saying then that a restaurant should be allowed to stay open until 2 a.m. and sell alcohol? No. All that's doing mm -hmm. is encouraging people to congregate. Yeah, and I don't think 2 a.m. is going to be the right number. Um, well, but I worry that 10 might be is too is too early. No. And why? Why would 10 be too early? And, and if 10 is too early, then what's the number? Because I I thought 10 was the right number, but what's, what's, well, 10 what's is the number? 10 basically has got to stop serving about 9, 9, 15, and everybody out the door at 10 o'clock. What about if uh, you have just takeout? Is that considered a restaurant? Mm -hmm. It would be. Mm-hmm. And so I guess the question for me comes back to congregating is the goal to limit that and why not say, well, let's just go to takeout. Let's just get that going as quickly as possible. People come in, people leave, they're not hanging out for too long and they're taking the food home. Probably feel? 10, 10 to 20 percent of our restaurants are going to go bankrupt during this. And if okay. we go to that route, I think it goes up to 30 to 40 percent will go bankrupt during this. And I guess my question becomes, how long do we allow something just as a conversation piece? Do we allow things to spread, continue on, and extend for a longer period of time, or are we trying to say what's the shortest route through it, just as a conversation? So Meaning sure. if we go to um, a more restrictive stance, then hopefully we can contain it a lot more effectively in a shorter period of time. That is, that's where I'm thinking. If we allow more and more openness, we kind of go on and on and on. Is it a swift route? or a longer route? I'm just curious, how do we take so, that? So we're the only city in the county right now looking at doing this, so it doesn't have to do anything to protect our population because the people who are going to dinner in Ormond Beach or Port Orange, are, you know, that live in Daytona, are coming back here and spreading in their neighborhood. You know, it's, it's, it's problematic that when you start to do things at a local level, you know, once again, the Bike Week thing yeah. was, a, 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 it was a statement that needed to be made, but ultimately, it was just a statement because mm -hmm. Norman and New Smyrna did great and people in Daytona got hurt economically and they probably weren't any safer because, you know, all those people were out in those places and came back here. So yeah. my yeah. next question is, are Ormond Beach, Holly Hill, Port Orange, all the cities, are they working with us <coughs> on this as well? Or are we the only ones again doing this? Because mm -hmm. Commissioner Gilliland is a valid point. Oh, you certain that that's a valid point and we say that even as it relates from state to state and I was, that's why I was very happy with the governor's uh, decisions today and had hoped that he would go one step further as it related to our beaches. Uh, where I am is that the more that we close, the faster we get to our destination. And if no one else uh, leads and, and, and goes down this direction, we're never going to get there. Someone has to set the tone for what is to take place. And very often that is left to Daytona Beach to set the tone for what is to take place. Um, and, and, you know, we'll get to the bike week uh, point later, but I think we need to work through these. And I understand, you know, how that hurt us. And in a way it was disadvantaged, but we offered things that other communities don't offer. And we had to control what was within our control. And so um, as it relates to this particular item, I'm just trying to figure out what's a reasonable time for a restaurant to be open and sell alcohol. 10 was later than I wanted, you know, because I want people, I want them to eat. I want them to patronize restaurants. I would prefer for them to go through drive throughs and do pickup pick up the food and go home. Um, but I do not want them, um, 50 and 100 people, 
in restaurants. Um, it, it, it's proven fact that the only way for us to to come out marginally successful in this is to is to sort of beat the curve and try to minimize the amount of infections. And so that's the greatest priority for me. And I don't know where everybody else stands, and I understand the economic impact, and we do have to try to address that and be considerate to that, but we're gonna have a greater economic e impact and a, a more adverse economic and health impact if we don't do all that we can to minimize this. So have you spoken with any of the other mayors? No, I have not spoken with any other mayors here. I have spoken with the county. What has their position been, sir? Well, they have different positions on, on and their, their opinion, um, you know, of differing of them are, are different from me. I don't want to try to regurgitate what they said. Unless the manager wants to do that, I, I prefer not to try to do that. Okay. So but what I'm saying is that we have to, we have to set a tone and lead. <clears throat> and that's just where I am. If we're not willing to do that, then, and I understand that, that our <clears throat> residents that go to Ormond and Ormond's residents come here. But if we close our facilities, they won't be coming here. Uh. You know what? I was in a different position when I walked in, to be quite honest with you. But after listening to Commissioner Gilliland, my concern is they left here at Daytona Beach, they went to Ormond Beach, they went to Holly Hill anyway, and then they maybe came back here again mm -hmm. to sleep here, do whatever, <coughs> go to the hotels here. Mm -hmm. So we just had transmission take place, and that was about it. And so would we be encouraging that again while at the same time suffering economic loss? I was in a different place when I walked in, and now I'm sitting here. I need some more information. I need some more, for me personally, I need some, some more support from the other cities to say that they're going to act in kind because we are dead center. Mm -hmm. The tourists come right back here. If, if we had, you know, the county for the shores, Ormond, Holly Hill, us, the shores, yes. South Daytona, yes. and Port Orange, the, the seven yes. of us are kind of isolated. Mm -hmm. if, if we were all doing the same and thing, this would mm -hmm. be a lot easier for me to say, this will have a meaningful public health benefit, and mm -hmm. we should do it. I don't think this has anything, I don't think this uh, provides any public health benefit to go this route, and I think that it, that it causes excessive economic damage because we're going to end up losing people that are going to spend their money in other communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Oh, just a second. Go ahead, Mr. Manor. You know, um, all of us have been here going through this process, and this has been an ongoing process. It started out at one point, and um, it's always, you know, it, it's easy to look back and say, well, I wish I'd done something different. Mm -hmm. But the same token, um, you have to consider all of the issues associated with the community, and, and it's not just economic. Economics is part of it. Commissioner Delgado, are you there? Okay, thank you for uh, joining us. We will appreciate that. The manager is uh, giving some commentary. We, we will need a motion oh. to authorize the uh, remote appearance uh, due to extraordinary circumstances. Okay. Do we need to reconsider the vote to excuse his absence? Uh, well, yeah, I suppose so at this mm -hmm. point. Um, okay. Uh, why don't we just move forward now that he's here? Uh, that motion can stand uh, because really it's correct at the time. Let, let's allow his absence now. Um, okay based on the extraordinary circumstance. Uh, and Commissioner Delgado, could you explain why you're appearing remotely? Yes, I contacted the clerk and the city manager earlier this morning, and due to the fact that I have a pregnant wife, I'm trying to avoid any potential exposure, and so I've kind of imposed a, self, a somewhat self-quarantine, and uh, I thought it was prudent that I could call in rather than appear in person. I didn't know how many people would be appearing. I didn't know what the circumstances were going to be as far as And you nailed it. We have five members of the public here. So, <laughs> here. Um, yeah, I make a motion to allow Commissioner Delgado to, to participate by telephone. Second. Thank you. Take a motion from Commissioner Gilliland. We'll take a second from Commissioner Reed. All those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those in opposition, same sign. Motion carries 6 0. 
Okay. Okay. Manage. Back where I was at. Uh, yeah. The this has kind of been a moving target for all of us because we started out at one point and and uh, we're now at a a uh, different point where the governor has taken an action that's uh, significantly stricter than anything that we had proposed. Um, and I guess trying to find what's the uh, the one action that will protect the health, safety, and welfare of our community, and at the same time not overly uh, adversely impact the economics of the community and, and kind of in some cases um, safety and welfare has to override economics right. and um, and that's a decision it's a policy decision that you all have to consider so and you can't really look at uh, I mean it's, it's nice to think all the cities along the coast and on in Volusia County they all take the same actions in every case but they're all very different cities our city is a very transient city. We have uh, 10 million people coming to our community every year. You've got uh, a number of events. This motorcycle event is a worldwide event. We have people from all over the world that came to Daytona Beach. Same is true of the racing. All the racing goes on at the track. So not every community is exposed to the same elements that we are in our community. And uh, trying to find uh, that even ground where um, or what is reasonable is the point I think the mayor's tried to make is um, how do we protect our citizens in the same time and I think he his decision and and certainly I supported his decision was one at which uh, uh, I think did provide a level of support for um, for the community overall but uh, this is now your decision from a policy standpoint mm -hmm. what is the time limit um, that we're imposing number or the F with the nightclubs and bars and restaurants do we have a definitive length of time? These uh, proclamations are good for seven days, and you can extend them for seven-day periods pursuant to your emergency management program. But but we can say as a part of the uh, process that we could make it for 30 days or uh, whatever time we determined, right? Well, there's, no, there's, uh -huh. there's, there's a bit of gray area. Some other cities have taken that position. Um, I would take the position that uh, your emergency management plan really dictates your approval process and your process for extending your declaration of an emergency. And, and that plan, as approved by you, allows for a declaration to be made by the mayor, it's good for seven days, and that that gets extended by the commission in seven-day intervals okay. indefinitely. Okay. Well, so the bar and nightclub thing, mm -hmm. actually, our ours is less restrictive, so the governor's order would would apply. Right, we can be in more restrictive. The restaurants, ours is more restrictive, right. which is the one that I wanted us to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <coughs> Commissioner Gillen's correct on that. We can be more restrictive, but not less restrictive than the governor's executive order. Okay. And so the question at hand now is the time. Mm -hmm. 10 p.m. Right. Um, <clears throat> and, and do we feel that we should have our uh, restaurants have the capacity to serve alcohol after 10 p.m. or even you know, a lower time than that? But I, I, I think 10 p.m. is appropriate. Mr. Mayor? The, yes, sir. everybody being dispersed at one time so that we don't have, you know, crowds on the street like a sea breeze or whatever. I don't know if that makes any sense or if that's just added complexity. It may just be added complexity. Uh, but I know some areas do that uh, to minimize calls for service and demand. So that's just something to think about. I don't know if that's already been discussed or, again, if people feel that's overkill. Um, but, you know, I don't know, again, like I said, if, if you know, we part of the goal is to prevent people from, acquiring the virus, but also to prevent a, huge, a drain on our system. 
So if we have, you know, a lot of people out and we need law enforcement or whatever. So that's just a thought that I had. I don't know if anyone else thinks there's any need to, to do that. Let me remind you that the governor's order limits occupancy to 50% of the current building occupancy. And sure. two, uh, it limits, gives guidance by ensuring a minimum six foot distance between any group of patrons and limiting parties to no more than 10 individuals. Mm -hmm. So I don't, are you saying a rolling closure so that people <laughs> leave the facility at the same time or at different times? Yes, sir. Just, I was just, I'm just envisioning, um, like, on last Friday, I went to Walgreens, and, you know, it was, there were still a lot of people out and about. If, every, if all of those patrons left at one time, you're going to have a ton of people congregating, you know, waiting for cars, cabs. And, not, again, nothing you can really do about that necessarily, and they are outdoors. But I just thought if Oyster Pub got out at 930 and the, uh, the bar across from my office got out at 945, and the sushi restaurant people got out at 9.50. It just might prevent a whole bunch of people congregating. But, again, that may be more complicated, and it may just be uh, unnecessary. But I just, if there's any concern there, that might be one way of doing things, um, just staggering some of this stuff. But, again, it may just be more complicated uh, to enforce or to make happen. So if, if no one else thinks that's of any use, then I'll just, just there's just a thought. Okay. So since we're only doing these in seven seven day increments maybe what we do is if whatever date whatever time we agree on um that we do that for seven days and then we ask the chief to give us a report on whether or not that seemed to, to create a hardship um you know on closures um you know then revisit it it would be a little uh difficult yeah it'd be a little awkward to enforce we should probably have to go with 30 minute increments and somebody who lost an hour to somebody else would be you know mm -hmm not not pleased mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yes. mm -hmm. but i but i agree with you Aaron. i think that's that's something that that is a something we do we need to be aware of i'm not I sure how enforceable i mean chief I mean, compare you can speak mm -hmm. to that but i'm not sure how enforceable that is i mean given the situation that yeah. we literally would have to list out each of the <laughs> restaurants that would be mm -hmm. open and then and then somehow through a lottery or something assign times to say you have to close at 8 30 you have to close at 9 you have to close no. at 9 30 you have to close no. at 10. that's too yeah, i would just say that's even number restaurants with even number street or you know if your address is an even number you close at 9 30 if your address is an odd number you close at 10 mm -hmm. o'clock or whatever I, I, I really don't i don't see what i thought we were referring to people inside the place and they would send the people out at a certain time. I don't think it matters if someone leaves Oyster Pub and the bar down on Main Street at the same time. That doesn't matter. I mean, it's they're going. Hopefully, they're going home. Well, what I'm saying is, if you got if you have a bar district and you have five or six restaurants where everybody's getting out at the same time, that's uh, all I would say. Okay, no, now, I, okay. That's, that's the situation that, I was visiting. Like. You know, if, if everybody is, if closing time is 10 o'clock and everybody in Main Street is congregating outside the bars at 10 o'clock, you might actually end yeah. up kind of with more people than you want in one place at one time. That's why I said half the people left at 9.30, the other half left at 10. That was the only, my only thought on that mm -hmm. point. It's probably more complicated than it's, than it's worth. But that's what I was saying. You know, even number of restaurants got out at quarter, quarter till and odds uh, got out at, you know, whatever, something like that. But it's just... Because not just the people in the rep, but when they get out, if they're milling around outside the establishment, as people tend to do, you you know, you kind of gone back to where you were, which is a loud, a large crowd of people. But I mean, again, we, it, 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 we don't know if, we don't know what it's going to look like right now, anyway. So I think coming in and adjusting it in a week or so makes a lot of sense. Okay. Okay. I I don't I don't think we can enforce that. Number one, I don't. I don't think it's uh, really advantageous to, to try to do that. Now, I will say this. One of the reasons that, that I, am, I am of a more firm posture than other cities is that, you know, we do have spring breakers and some of the things that the manager alluded to, uh, and we do have uh, more businesses that people want to frequent and congregate in than other municipalities and therefore I think we have to uh, try to regulate those things uh, with a heavier hand perhaps than other cities so um, all right back to the time 10 p.m. so let me ask one more question um, mm -hmm. isn't our rule 
maybe Mr. Morris, you know the answer to this off the top of your head, the, uh, that for like a bar closing, that they have to stop serving it at a certain time and then everybody has to be out by a different time, yeah. right? That's for alcoholic beverages, right? That's right. Right. So obviously that won't be an issue under the executive order where there won't be allowed to serve alcoholic beverages if you're a bar. So the bar can't serve at all. Right. But the restaurant, so that applies, that applies to restaurants as well. But they have to stop serving at 2.30 and everybody out at 3, I think it is. So, um... You know, I mean, you know, I know Mr. Meyer is a restaurant owner here. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of like to hear what, what, you know, what, what people think. But well, you're going to be allowed to speak, and if you want to take your two minutes and thirty seconds, uh, is his name? Is he one of the speakers? We don't have. We don't have, we don't have speakers. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're doing okay. a little different. Go ahead, Mr. Meyer. And if you, when you come to the uh, mic, if you can just state your name and address for the record, thank you. My name is Daniel Myra. I'm the owner of Cruz and Cafe. First, I want to give you guys... Where, where is that located? On uh, A1A and Main, Main, Street. Main Street. First, the alcohol and food. The difference between a bar and a restaurant, the restaurant has to be able to serve food till closing. That means anytime somebody walks in there till 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning, we have to have food available for them. If we don't have food available, then that license is no good. That's the four COP. The rules of four COP, that's what you need to do. That's the rules on that. Now, our business works more after 10 o'clock. When all the big restaurants like Olive Garden and all the corporation closes at 10 because they've got rules. They close at 10 and they don't care. We work after that time. So at 10 o'clock, that's when we start making our food business because that's when people want to come and eat. So this is not going to work for us. It doesn't make sense that at 10 o'clock, we're going to have to close. If you go out after 10 o'clock, that's when all those big corporate businesses, that's when they close. And that's when we start being busy for food. So the rules of the CDC, I think it makes sense. We can take 50% of the occupation, that's no problem. Clean up every time after somebody leaves. I think that would, that's something we already did during bike week. Every time a person, we use bleach and we clean every seat and every time every person. The only difference we added is our servers will be bringing you your food with gloves on and every time they go in and change it. But to stop us from doing that, that's going to put everybody in, out of business. I mean, I don't see any other way to stay in business for that. And to say that we can open at 6 in the morning, we don't open till 11. And we don't get busy till about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, because we deal with a lot of people that don't come in for lunch at 11 o'clock. They come in at 12.31. Dinner is usually at 8. So we have a different kind of timing. So that's going to really put a dent a major dent on us, on the employees and everything. So I don't see how, I mean, I'll do accept the part that we have to put six feet between. We don't have to use every table. We can separate every other table. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, we can separate people. Like, we don't have to put one next to the other one. Absolutely. I think we agree because we are part of it, too. But to be able to close at 10 o'clock is... Like I said, well, we're, not, we're actually not saying close at 10 o'clock. We're saying uh, discontinue the sale of alcohol. I mean, we're going to be there. That's the time. That's, that's, that's the question at hand. See, our license requires us to keep our kitchen open. Our we're alcohol license. Well. COP. Oh. COP license. Oh, okay. You see the part of bar and the nightclub? Yes, they have no food, that's normal, and everybody's, but for us as a restaurant, we can put people apart. Okay, all right, thank you.
and Mr. Mayor, the, it, it says that they're mandated yeah, right. to close for daily uh, for business daily at or before 10 p.m. is what the, it's currently said. For all restaurants, mm -hmm. restaurants, it, it, bars, yeah, the restaurant bars, restaurant bars, bars. Like clubs, <coughs> right? Bars. But couldn't you separate and let the restaurant stay open? That, and that's what I'm mm -hmm. hoping that's what we all kind of some consent. Yeah, the restaurant. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement mm -hmm. letting the restaurant stay open, but I don't think they need to serve alcohol. So what you're saying is stopping the sale of alcohol at 10, but the restaurant can stay open and serve food. Sure. I think it, I'm not sure, Bob, I don't know. Um, if we separate restaurants out and say that? I, I'm not Wait sure minute. if you've got a COP license, that's, that's a bar license for uh, even, if, <coughs> even if you're a restaurant. I'm not sure that they don't have to comply with the with the governor's order oh. as a as a bar well, but they all start out for cop something it used to be in srx was the restaurant license now it's yeah. got a different suffix on there but you know that's the uh um uh, you know uh, hooligans or or outback olive right. garden you know the, those are the kind of restaurants that those are the things that are licensed in a way that, that I'm talking about allowing them to, to stay open, you know, not till two o'clock in the morning, but something beyond 10. As far as restaurants go or, or including bar service or what? Well, having, if somebody wants to have a drink with their dinner, I don't see any reason to say, you know, I mean, obviously we don't want to, we don't want to have dance floors. You know, if somebody's got a restaurant that has a dance floor, we don't want to allow that to be operational. Um, you know, but if, uh, uh, it wouldn't be uncommon or let's let's say sports weren't canceled you know and somebody wanted to come in and watch the laker game you know at, at hooligans you know and and have dinner in, in there they, but they're eating at you know nine ten o'clock at night because that's when the, the laker game started you know i mean granted that's not the case right now but you, you'd be surprised how many people that's just sort of their you know the way they 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 are accustomed to, to live in their lives you know, and I think Mr. Myra brings up a great point about the fact that, you know, there's a lot of people that work at these corporate chains, you know, that when they get off, they come to the local guys. So what this does is it, it, is it disproportionately affects in a negative way the locally owned restaurants as opposed to the, the national chains where those, that, you know, that, that profit doesn't stay here, you know, um, you know but the, the locally owned, you know, does. Okay. Um, I'm confused. What's the position that you all uh, have on this? Uh, John. Oh, John, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. John Nixon, uh, 314 North Grandview. Was close. <laughs> you missed it the last time, too. 413 North Grandview Avenue. Uh, I manage the largest uh, dance club in Miami, the largest black club in Miami, the largest adult club in Miami, and the largest restaurant in Miami. So I'm familiar with this, and I understand when people came to the dance club, they came in four different stages. They came when it opened. They came when the, most of the American restaurants closed because they closed at 10 o'clock. The Cubans don't eat till 8 and 10, so they would come in at 12. The night clubs or the restaurants that would close at 1, we would get them at 2. The, close, the clubs that closed at 3 came at 4. The most lucrative hour for us was between 2 and 5 in the morning because that's when the restaurant people, the workers came and they spent like bandits. All these clubs are different. All these clubs require different things. They also make their money off the liquor. That is where they're, so we are telling them, well, you can be open, but you can't make money, which doesn't make sense to me. Like we, we closed the last day, the most <laughs> lucrative day of bike week, the most attended day of bike week. And we closed and told all those people that rely on that money that they could not make any money. So I'm asking you to please think about what you're doing because you're sitting there saying, oh, well, it's okay. That they, they will be okay in a restaurant at 9.59, but at 10 o'clock, they're gonna kill somebody with a virus. You know, it, it doesn't make sense. Bike week, if you walk down the sidewalk of bike week on that Saturday night, it was packed. Yeah. They were there anyway. When Delgado says, well, let's alternate closing times. Well, that's why we changed from 3 o'clock closing to 2 o'clock. Darlene Jordan said everybody from Holly Hill would drive into Daytona Beach and they'd get into accidents. So we have to close at the same time as everybody else. But we compromised. We'll close at 
but they don't leave until 3 o'clock, and it's packed on those sidewalks. So no matter what you do, they're going to be packed on the sidewalks anyway. They're going to be on the sidewalks of Main Street for Bike Week. You, it's human behavior. You're not going to alter that. And I understand you, you try to, to do this, but if you say you, you can't drink liquor at 10 o'clock, but you can stay there. So you have 100 people at 9.59, and you have 100 people at 10.01. What's the difference? So when you're selling alcohol, it's really not changing the behavior of people. If they're out there already, which is what we do, the spring breakers are not going to go to bed at 7, 8, 9, 10 o'clock. They're out to party, and they will be out till 3 o'clock. If not there, they'll do what they did two years ago, and they'll be in front of the Hilton. There are almost 400 spring breakers standing for no reason, no alcohol, no nothing, in front of the clock tower between 3 and 5 in the morning on a Saturday night because they could do it. So please think about all the people that are going to lose their jobs, they're going to lose their, their income. When you said it's going to be for a week, Section C says two months. Eight weeks. Two months is a lot of time to go without a paycheck. Thank and you, John. Okay. Okay. You all just want to go with the governor's, because uh, I'm not hearing anyone else. Uh, the only thing I was saying was to limit the sale of alcohol. I, I was think... okay with them staying open, uh, but... I, I still stand by that's, that's my... I, I understand I your position, and I understand the logic behind it. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I'm kind of, as I'm weighing this, you know, we've got, um, you know, n number one, don't forget, we're going to revisit this in seven days. So if something in the next seven days happens, we're, we're, we're talking about leaving it the way it is, it was last night, tonight. You know, that's, that's it's not like we're, 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 we're being looser with the rules because of this we're, we're maintaining what we've got so like i said in seven days we if we decide that um you know we get reports back because we're gonna have to have code and cops and people out there to look in to make sure that they got the six feet separation that they don't have these big congregations of 20 people sitting you know at a, at a big long table um you know we still have are going to have an enforcement obligation related to the, the governor's order so uh you know i I think that the you know there are you know doctors, infectious disease specialists, epidemiologists, chemists, biologists, everybody that that you know you know all kinds of things I can't even pronounce that that have put the, gotten together and talked about you know how you know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense, and for them to come back and say no more than ten and the six feet separation, screening your employees, that 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 makes sense today. Um, I'm comfortable following their, their guidance and saying that that's what we should do, um, particularly because, you know, you, you, know, you don't want to have a dance club like John was des describing open at all because you're not going to be able to get separation. You're not going to be able to, to, to manage that situation. So, you know, I'm, it, it, this is only the restaurants I'm speaking of, but I think that we, uh, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with the, the guidance that came out of Tallahassee today um, going forward. But you want only seven days instead of 30 days? The, the government's uh, or the uh, I'm well, sorry, the executive order from the governor would apply. So as I'm hearing the consensus, and I'll have you confirm, for item F, we will just eliminate a, a daily time to be closed for bars, restaurants, and nightclubs. Is that correct? So we, I think we just and that would be closed for 30 days? Is no, the, there'll be, the bars will not serve alcohol per the governor's order, and restaurants will be limited to 50% capacity per the governor's order. But no alcohol? No, they what can serve the alcohol. Nightclubs, the, the bar, Excuse me? Nightclubs? Restaurants, to answer uh, Mr. Traeger's question first, restaurants can serve alcohol. But bars, but bars would not be open, and nightclubs would not be open. Bars can be open and serve food, but not serve alcohol. Mm -hmm. And nightclub. That's a little screwy. <laughs> and that's well, a little, what would you say? I said that's a little bit messed up. I don't so I don't know that we have any bars that serve food where more than 50% of their sales are coming from. Alcohol. Well, that's what the SRX licenses are. No, no, no. Those are more than 50% are non-alcohol. Right. Well, you know, so, you know, I don't know that we, 
I don't know if we have any because, um, you know, I mean, there, there's probably something out there I just don't know about. But, you know, I think, as I recall, they mostly went away when they got rid of the, uh, if you serve food, you can't smoke, you know, rule 20 years ago. <clears throat> so, you know, this is, this is, you know, and, and I've got a very odd situation with restaurants in my zone because there's a lot of them. And, you know, it is, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking probably five to 10,000 people that are employed in these restaurants. Mm -hmm. And, you know, limiting their ability to make money is mm -hmm. something that is already happening. Um, you know, the, the restaurant owners that I've talked to in the last couple of days have said that their sales are generally, they're, you know, down around 50%, you know, 40% to 60%. Mm -hmm. People just aren't comfortable going out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, those servers that rely on tips to, you know, to pay for after school programs and things like that, they're, that's not coming in, you know. And then in uh, in zone three, we have a lot of restaurants too on the beach side. If they don't eat there, they're going to go somewhere else to eat and come right back if they're staying at the hotels. Exactly. So it doesn't affect us in the way we're hoping. Drive for those up just two past areas. Sea Breeze and yeah. Sea Breeze High School, and you're in Ormond, and you can, you know, they didn't do anything. We are going to be under the governor's rules, correct? Yeah, it's going to be for 30 days, correct? If you don't um, adopt something more strict than that, you will be under the governor's rules. If we, unless we go stricter than Unless that. you go stricter, right. Do you consider seven days instead of 30 days stricter or not? Well, you're limited to 30 days in terms of your authority. The governor doesn't have that limitation. Say again? You're limited in your authority to uh, declare a state of emergency to seven days seven days by okay. statute and by your own emergency management program now the governor does not that, have such a restriction that would uh, be better than the governor's i mean would be more um the, would the, be first and the, the governor's thing would be second or no, the, vice versa the, the governor governor's rules take priority, priority over that's it. our local rules okay we can be stricter but we we can't be uh, less strict so in other, in other words we're under the governor's rules anyhow yes yes so unless we're stricter Seven days doesn't make any difference. It's 30 days anyhow. In terms of the governor's rules, yes. But, Bob, we have to come back in seven days to reauthorize our emergency declaration. You do. So that, that's where I'm saying if we come back a week from now and there's problem, there's, there's trouble, then, you know, it is not working. The that we find out that, that everybody's, you know, yeah. wanting the rules and there's the bars, you know, the, 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 the bars, like, you know, the bar bar, the actual physical bar at, hooligans has people sitting in every seat yeah. which violates the six foot rule you know then then i think we need to revisit it so what is our standard then what how do we enforce this how do we check to see that instead what's our criteria for this is where we are and this is where we're going so the city law enforcement has the authority to enforce the governor's executive directive uh, also the um Department of, of uh, Business and Professional Re Regulation does. Yeah. So it would be the police department. To code, maybe? Would code yeah. also be able to enforce These, are, I believe, are misdemeanors under the um, department's guidelines, and so it would be police department. Police department. And I'm sorry, what is the, what is the, um, the fine as a misdemeanor? What happens if they're found to be breaking the law? I'm just curious. Uh, they're subject to arrest. Okay. There's a state law involved too, and I don't know exactly what that that would be. State law. So this so. what we're passing, it doesn't make any difference because the governor supersedes us. Again, you can be more strict than the governor. You cannot be less. Strict. It, it, it makes a difference because we're choosing not to go beyond the governor. We're but this is under. less than the governor. Is that correct? No, the, the timeline, no. it really should be set aside. That's another issue in terms of how the length of time for which your regulations would be effective. The question is whether your regulations are more strict or less strict. Are our are, are regulations more stricter than the governor? The regulations that are proposed in the mayor's executive uh, order are more strict. Okay. For, no. inst for instance, the executive order from the governor does not have a time limit for closing bars and restaurants. This would impose a time limit of 10 p.m. for closing. But the governor said they're going to be closed, period. No, the no. governor just says that bars won't yeah. serve alcohol. And the
100% capacity and have the separation okay. requirements. Right. And so the bars can be open, but bar they don't serve alcohol. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. And you're right, Ruth. That's a squirrely thing to think about. Yeah. <laughs> so. Did the governor say anything about nightclubs? It's under what did they say? Because I'm missing something. I thought he did, but I, I want to know what they're... It's all together for nightclubs. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. Section 1. Okay. I, I, I'm going to make sure nightclubs are in there because that's really what I... I well, I'm most, most interested in, in keeping the people from getting sick mm -hmm. because it sounds like this is a horrible, horrible, very contagious disease. And... Um, you're saying close all the restaurants too? Well, what they say, Huck, hunker in place. But I mean, uh, the three states up north have gotten together and have managed to uh, con Connecticut, New York, and I believe it's New Jersey. They've kind of gotten together and made uh, uniform. So you can't, uh, if you live in New York and decide, hey, maybe New Jersey is easier. I'm going to go there. Ain't going to be because it's the same thing. So can we do, can we work with the other cities at all? Are they open to working with us that it's, you know, within driving distance that they can't just, is it possible? Oh, it's possible. Well, and I'll reach out to them. Because to unfortunately. see where, where they, they stand. It's, this disease doesn't know boundaries. No. Mr. Mayor, what was your reasoning behind the, the 10 p.m.? Uh, 10 p.m., well, a large part of this is, for my objective, is to keep the, because this was before the governor, and I had hoped that the governor would do what he did today, mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, but it was to keep spring breakers from being out and being in bars and in nightclubs uh, in close proximity of one another. So the objective is to keep them at home. You know, as I've said, I, I don't want them to visit right now. Stay home. Uh, we know how that goes. Mm -hmm. um, Are they already here? Yeah, <laughs> they're already here and they're not leaving. Mm -mm. Um, but the more things that we do to discourage them, because we can believe that, you know, just as uh, Fort Lauderdale closed their beaches, Hollywood then closed their beaches. And just as, you know, I was speaking with the mayor from Coco on yesterday, he called because all of their folks are coming to his town mm -hmm. from spring break. So they just start migrating to northern beaches uh, in an effort to, you know, to mm -hmm. enjoy their spring break. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to put in more measures so that they will stay at home. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about, you know, that's really what it's about for me. And okay. I think the county had a meeting at 530 as well. So well they met Orlando before. originally was going to not but, allow alcohol sales in restaurants, and they have uh, reconsidered that, and they are not changing it. Oh. No, the what I believe the county is following the governor's um, adopted regulations. Yeah, they're not going to go beyond that. Okay. What's the next letter? Bob? Okay. So from what I'm hearing now, then, really this relates to F and G. Um, we will not establish a uh, closing time for bars and restaurants. And, and likewise, we'll go with the governor's restriction for restaurants on 50% occupancy. What was drafted here in G was to limit occupancy to 50% for bars, nightclubs, and restaurants. So if you want to go more restrictive as drafted, you can, or you can go with the uh, governor. Is that? But you're still assuming that a, a nightclub with no revenue would open and let people come in and hang out? Or eat. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they have a restaurant, right? So there are bars with restaurants um, and nightclubs with restaurants, for that matter. Um, and I, let me point out one more thing. The governor may clean up his order, too, as time goes on. He, they may see these loopholes, and they could fix it, and, and that could happen at any point uh, as well. So um, we don't want to foreclose the possibility that things will change rapidly uh, through executive orders from the governor. Well, the governor's order is if, you, if more than half of your revenue is derived from liquor sales, then you can no longer serve liquor. That's correct. Um, and I am, uh, it's, a, it's a, the licensee in that case. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think they're close. I think the, the, the things that are pure bars, um, uh, and liquor stores, that little place right behind us here, the one or saloon. Uh -huh. 
yeah. this little beer wine place, they don't serve food. They're, they, they should be closed right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in, in, it's not very big anyways. You put six feet between people in there, you're only going to get a couple people in there. Um, you know, I don't think we have a risk of, you know, I think they're violating the governor's order if they try and open, period. You know, but Outback Steakhouse, you know, they can they could open every other booth you know, and, and keep the separation and allow probably, you know, half their staff to continue to, to, to have an income. A lot of these restaurants already have that separation. Yeah. And, you know, like uh, the... Uh, I talked this one with, with an owner earlier today who said that what they did was they, they closed every other booth and they took half the tables out and put them in the back on the pool tables because they didn't want people playing pool. I was in yeah. Hooligans yesterday and there's more than six feet between those, those yeah. uh, tables there. Well, their revenue's down anyways. I mean, it's yeah. not like they got, you know, people waiting in line to come inside. It's, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to have a problem of, you know, allowing only 50% of their seating be utilized and, and, you know, have a wait. Right. So what I'm hearing is we'll eliminate F and G from the executive order. Is that correct? Yeah. Right, and we'll go with the um, governor's executive order on those points. For seven days. Well, no, the governor's is good is for 30, 30 days. But we have to come back in seven. We have to come back for what for the remaining points in in this executive order and uh, declaration of emergency. So then we can move on. Uh, the rest should be uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, letter H uh, simply closes Breakers Park and Ritchie Plaza to the public, excluding the pier and associated parking lots. Any conversation concerning that? Okay. Uh, letter I uh, essentially cancels meetings for the seven-day period, public meetings for the seven-day period uh, of the city commission and city boards, including the advisory boards, and also code enforcement and special magistrate. And again, if this is renewed, those will be canceled for that period as well. Uh, letter J is, is sort of a nuts and bolts uh, purchasing uh, provision, allows the manager to make emergency purchases and allows um, people submitting competitive bidding and uh, proposals to do so remotely instead of in person by sealed envelope. And um, the rest of the requirements uh, were previously provided in the prior executive order. Letter K uh, simply instructs em employees who feel sick to stay home. And letter L uh, deals with utility services, which will not be discontinued uh, or disconnected during the period of the declaration. Can I ask a question, sir? Um, as it relates to as it relates to enforcement of these so can people cut it was a question posed can you cut through Ritchie Plaza can you use the boardwalk I mean what happens exactly so you're visiting how do you maneuver in that area this is going to be more of a question for the chief or, or the managers how that might be cordoned off or enforced but I presume there'd be some sort of marking just, or, or signage this won't be a gathering place it's, it's uh, it, you know they will have to provide for them to walk through there but it's not a place where we'll congregate and so we can you can use the you can use the areas you can walk you can the, walk through it for passage to get from point a to point b but yeah. so if you're let's say you're a guest or let's say you're just walking there you can do that or do you have to have a purpose intent i'm going no. to that just we're so just, you can it's be just going to be closed to any gathering five gathering. people ten right. people okay and we'll 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 have it marked and then i have one more question um so from, from moving forward, since we're in a state of emergency right now, do we convene regularly? Do we communicate in terms of at meetings? If we have any decisions that come up, how do we handle that? If anything important comes up, how do we manage that? In the next month, seven in days, the, 10 days? Mm -hmm. well, That's why we have, this is seven days. Okay. And at the end, before the end of that seven days, you'll have another meeting to talk about anything that that came up. Okay. And what if anything comes addressed? up unexpected within the seven days? Do we convene again? Do you have any? Uh, no. Well, we could if I called we an could. emergency meeting. Um, so certainly we could. Okay. Well, we had to meet every seven days to renew the declaration. We do. Right. We do. You, you we do. have to meet every seven days. You do. Yeah. Again, I'm, I'm hopeful, and I know a request has been made to the governor's office that he'll waive those requirements and allow meetings to be conducted remotely. But at this point, there's no 
exemption recognized by the Attorney General or through the statutes uh, for these sort of emergency meetings? Yeah, I went through that all morning with a TPO meeting next Wednesday. So we're going to have 10 people there, and everybody else is coming in on a WebEx type thing. No. Because we have to have a majority in person to have a quorum to have a meeting. And we're under such tight time frames under federal transportation for doing our long range plan, transportation plan, we can't skip a meeting. So um, trying to find Deb Denny's is coming, and I'll be there. I need eight more volunteers, we can have a meeting. So. Can I ask a, a question about leadership in general? Um, if we want to get a test, health department, is that correct? No, you first place to call is your primary physician. care physician. Okay. Yeah. All right. Are we doing, I'd like to ask some questions about K for the city employees. It's indicating that if they're feeling ill, they have to stay home. Are we letting anyone telecommute? Um, can can yes. employees work from home? Yeah. Okay, we yes. are documenting that. We do. All right, and are we doing any testing of the employees? Right now, every day I go into work, they're testing us before we go in our building. No, we... Okay. Yeah, they're doing the temperature thing before we go in. Are we Only, doing anything like that for city employees before? No, we do not have that right now. Okay. Is that something we're considering? Uh, we were not planning on it this time. What do you think, Paula? I think maybe we can need to consider that. I mean, you're, mm -hmm. you're doing it, uh, and that sounds like a pretty good idea to me. Mm -hmm. We do it okay. every me morning. Me too. Every morning. Started yesterday. Yeah. And what does your test involve? Just temperature? Just temperature. Just temperature. Okay. And we'll start the, the triage area, right? Well, there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's several components to testing. I mean, one, if you take your temperature, that's one. Mm -hmm. But there's also, you've been traveling. You, where have you been out of the country? or And they ask us those questions yeah. as well, yeah. and they That's take standard. our temperature. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a real, like, four or five questions that okay. are germane. They're in the governor's order. So the restaurant's going to have okay. to ask those now. Okay. We have a motion, so we need to hear from the other speakers uh, who want to speak to this item. You've already spoken to the item, sir. <laughs> You've, already <coughs> You've already spoken You've to already the spoken item. You've already spoken to it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You wash your hands recently, John? I know. <laughs> I don't see anyone else signing okay. up to speak. All right. We have a motion and a second. Uh, George, did you want to speak? No. no okay. <laughs> um, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, let it be noted by saying aye. 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 Those in opposition, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Motion. Is this your idea? Like you, this is the one you think is closed? Okay. So what, what he's, he's listed out a bunch here that, that Froggy's Boot Hill, Dirty Harry's, Bag and Blue's Full Moon, Neptune's, Mai Tai's, uh, Kerr's Wing House Tap Room, Razzle's 409 Coyote Ugly Garage, uh, Frank's Front Row, which now is a different name, Doc's, Lollipops, and Molly Brown's is but the ones he listed out here. But uh, he listed out for what? What's he saying? That's the ones he's thinking are going to be closing under the governor's order. Yeah. So remember, more than half of your revenue is derived from liquor. Uh, liquor then you cannot can no longer sell liquor. Yeah. It would be open, as Bob pointed out, but you can no longer sell sell liquor. So that these are the ones where he thinks that they would. Uh, um, and there's there's more. You know, I mean, half times. Ages, mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's several out on my side of town that uh, would be in the same situation. So, does that mean like Walmart can't sell liquor either? It's on premise consumption. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But this goes this goes throughout Florida, so it's not just us in Daytona Beach here. It's, everybody. The state. it's everybody in the state. Yeah, that's the whole state. Okay, the whole state. Yeah. And Bob, um, you'll get us an amended copy of the order to go with the resolution? That's correct. Okay. Okay. And that will be available in my office for the public once I get it. And can you email us? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, do we have any other questions or comments on this item? All right, I don't know who we started with tonight. Uh, discussion uh, from commission. I just started with Traeger. Uh, we start with Traeger. Well, okay. I'm very else? concerned about the health naturally. Um, this seems like this is the tip of a very big iceberg. 
and where I, it hurts me a lot to think of what might be ahead, like beach closing and everything. I understand that this is a health question, and uh, I was listening to the television. They're talking about it can go like a peak, or else it can go kind of smooth, and we don't have the hospital facilities, God forbid, if, if it should come to a peak. So I think we did the right thing. All right. Um, my concern is uh, for the, um, believe it or not, the, the mental health condition of the community as we go through this, um, especially with the kids being at home and the families at home right now, and again, specifically with mental health, because we're trying to figure out in the mental health community, can we go to telehealth, who's licensed to do it, who's not, and how the insurance companies are going to manage that, because if we are not having contact with clients, that's the next best thing. Um, overall, I would prefer that we are intense and short and try to do yeah. go with extreme measures to keep it tight as opposed to letting it drag out Quick for under. months and months and months. That's kind of where I am with future decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Commissioner Gilliland. And that's, that's what Ruth, Ruth was bringing up. All these measures, you know, the infection <laughs> curve has a tendency to get real steep real fast. And we're just trying to flatten that thing through measures like this, keeping people separated. That's what, the, you know, the governor, the president, um, you know, that's, that's what all of these efforts are trying to, to get to. And, uh, and they change, you know, at this point almost daily. And I, I think we just need to be prepared that, uh, you know, if something happens in the next couple of days, we need to be back here on Thursday and Friday to, to, exactly. to do something different. I mean, it's... It, it is that serious, and it is. It, it's not. It's. It's not that it's a terrible strain of the flu. It's just so god awful infectious mm -hmm. that you know it, it's very very easy for it to transmit. And, and so is that what we're prepared to do? Just meet as often as we need to to make decisions as they come up. Is that that's what I was wondering? Okay. I think so. Okay. But we're doing the right things here, and I and I do have confidence that the where the, the, the federal and state governments, the CDC, the Department of Health, mm -hmm. where, where they got to with their rules and the today's order was the right thing for us to do um, today. That might be different tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much where we were yesterday, was where they are. And we added a few things today that we rejected. Go ahead, Commissioner Henry. Uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the decision that we made tonight. You all know I have a soft spot for people and businesses, uh, spe especially our small businesses, um, because their business is what drives their households. It doesn't buy new yachts. It doesn't buy new um, <laughs> mansions. It, it, it takes care of their households. It takes care of their families. And so um, I, I came in, like Juanita, I came in with a different thing in mind, and then I heard the young man from the Cruising Cafe talking, and I, and I thought, you know, maybe I'm not being. He's not that young. You're young enough. He's, he's, he's young at heart. He's young at heart. <laughs> and when I heard him, it really made me really see and think about um, the small businesses that are going to be affected tremendously if we did things differently. So I'm very comfortable with, with, with the decision that we made. And I, I'm, I'm Still very nervous about those businesses in Daytona. All we need is, is something to where 20, 30 percent of our businesses start slowing down and, and they can't pay this bill and have the snowball effect. And the long term outcome of this, you know, it's, it's unknown at this point. So we want to be cautious on one end as far as preventing the disease, the, the virus, but we also want to be cautious on the other end is people got to live after this. And they have families that they have to support as well, and businesses that they have to support. Um, and I just want to thank the critical care responders and first responders because, man, what I'm seeing out there and, and, and what they're having to do and working through this and, and not having a choice but having to go to work and having to get out there and be in contact with people who perhaps may have this virus or... Um, may absolutely have this virus and and they're not allowed to take the day off and and, and say hey i'm not going to do this so i just want to all of our first responders all of our critical care responders all of our nurses and doctors you know and they're away from their families and possibly going home 
spreading things to their families. I just want to say thank you and that you're, you're very much appreciated and um, get that message out there. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, that may be something that we want to um, post on our website to say thank you to those in the medical field that are continuing to serve our, our citizens. <clears throat> I do want to say, and, and Rob alluded to this, um, that the, um, the Midtown area was struck greatly by the decision that was made on Friday, and I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, I spoke to the manager yesterday in regards to how those on, some on Main Street did not comply with the order, and um, what were we going to do? And one of the suggestions or things that apparently we do do is that uh, they cannot participate in the next um, event and or they need to be fined. If they didn't or respect the orders that our police and, and code enforcement and the mayor uh, put down, then they need to re recognize that we are a city that's concerned about its citizens and that executive order was real. So I, I do think that we need to um, address that when that time comes. I do want to say that because um, Second Avenue closed down. Mm -hmm. We recognize that that's what you said and although it was, it was a great um, devastation, you know, and a great loss, they, they complied. They respected your order and they complied. And those who said, what you gonna do? I think we know we need to show them what we gonna do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I concur with that 100%. Yes, sir. That concludes 100%. my comment. Did, did they get a prorated feedback for, um, for the fees that they paid? Yes, they did. Okay. Yes, they did. Do, will any of the merchants get prorated fees back for having to shut down early? Not currently. No? Not currently. That means there's still hope. <laughs> well, Man, that's something, you, that's it, something it, we need to discuss. They lost, sure. so, they lost so much money, and I just think of all those people who went out and bought all of that stuff, and then all of a sudden to abruptly have to shut mm -hmm. down. But if you prorate it, you're going to get back one-tenth or something, I don't you know, know, based on the number of days. But isn't there a force majeure clause in, the, in that uh, application? Maybe, I don't know. I don't know offhand, but I can tell you, you know, you certainly have executive authority to uh, implement the emergency measures without compensating businesses for their mm -hmm. losses. So it's it, in bottom line, it's your decision. If you want to do that, uh, I don't know, arguably you could. I might have to search for a public purpose, but um, we could probably work that out as a policy matter. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. Even though no policies may, uh, he, he's going to be so, like, wait, let me, let me go to Commissioner Delgado. Commissioner Delgado? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Do you have anything? I, I, may have, um, I may have missed this discussion in the beginning, but I saw, for example, a, an email from Commissioner Reed about um, water and not showing off people's uh, water meters and things like that during this time period. And that, you know, that led me to think about, you know, what actions we can take at this local, ultra-local level to try to soften some of the impact that this is going to have on our residents and our businesses' pocketbooks. I've gotten numerous calls from small business owners who are, you know, petrified that this is going to uh, put them out of business, you know, um, and everyone's very uncertain. I mean, obviously, we just talked about the impact it's going to have on bars and restaurants, but, uh, you know, we're a service, uh, service sector town. And, you know, a lot of our small businesses already struggle with making ends meet and rely on special events and, you know, uh, tourist dollars to make it through. So there's no doubt they're going to have a very difficult time uh, this year. And, you know, so, you know, while what we're talking, I mean, I guess there's really kind of two goals in fighting the pandemic at this point. One is to, you know, prevent yourself from getting it. And the other is to kind of flatten the curve so we don't stress out all of our ability to respond. But then looking past that, what does it look like when we start trying to kind of get back to normal? So I, I want to see what we can do as a city to try to help our businesses and our community members, um, you know, get through this and financially as well. So I thought Commissioner Reed's point was really well taken. I couldn't respond, obviously, for, uh, you know, public record reasons. But I, I think stuff like that, little things that we can do will add up big time. So I, I'm kind of racking my brain trying to think of things that we can do at a city level. Obviously, we don't have the capability of giving citizens just, you know, cash or checks like is being discussed at the, uh, the federal level. Uh, but I was thinking about our, the program that we work with with the doctors to provide medical treatment. Um, so we do have some things like that that we may be able to leverage to get help for people. Obviously, you know, uh, testing and things like that, I, I'm sure there's federal programs for things like that. But um, what, what are some things that we can do 
if we're interested at the local level to help our citizenry. Um, and that's probably a, a conversation for another day or, you know, something um, that staff may have to get back to us on. But I'm just looking for, you know, what little areas we can uh, – we can supplement or help people out in, like the, the water bills and things like that. Little things like that can add up pretty quickly for people who are on the, you know, on the cusp. So um, I'd like to hear from any of the other commissioners mm -hmm. if that's acceptable, Mr. Mayor, if they have any ideas or thoughts about it. If that's not appropriate for today, then, then I understand as well. Uh, well, as you notice, the, uh, as a part of our resolution uh, or our <coughs> order is not to uh, discontinue the water during the this time uh, right. and I had seen that from other municipalities and certainly was in agreement that we didn't want to do that um, we have to give some thought I have no other thoughts off the top of my um. head but I was as I was riding in I, I don't think this is going to be a short-term uh, inconvenience or problem for our community and our nation so as we think about things that we as a city can do, uh, we have to think about doing them. And some of the things uh, the manager and I discussed as it related to even our uh, aftercare programs that we have in the community, uh, things that relate to children. Uh, I think we have to be a vehicle, a, a conduit for um, helping parents because our children are going to be home for two months mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like uh, April 15th, I think, mm -hmm. is the recent yeah. order, but I don't expect uh, after it comes back, it'll probably turn into May 15th. Uh, and so they'll be home for two months, so we have to uh, dedicate ways to help the parents to teach them and to find ways for even, uh, we think about it, our first responders, people who have to work at the hospitals, they all have to have child care. Mm -hmm. So we have to find some ways to... Um, uh, help help all of them and I certainly don't have any of the answers at this moment but my my mind was um, certainly uh, amped up in my ride here with thoughts about those things so I don't know if anyone else mm -hmm. has any ideas but uh, um, well I made a phone call to the city manager maybe I'm hoping it's the appropriate venue for this he asked me to write a letter to Miss uh, La Magna and so I decided I would not spend any of the bike week funds that I received um, I'm going to rescind that and instead I'm going to ask that my bike week funds all of them go to housing authority and of the six thousand dollars I believe I would like for uh, two thousand dollars of the six to specifically go toward the seniors in Windsor Maley apartments and the remaining 4,000 um, housing authority can do with as it sees fit to help the community that they serve. So that is what we're, that's what the city is doing on behalf of, you know, my zone three. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. M Thank you. Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. really quick. Um, so although we are ceasing disconnection going forward, um, we don't want people's bills to add up. Mm. Is there going to be a way that we're going to have it where people will be able to come back and um, and make payment plans for their particular water bills? Because on the back end, on the front end, it's really great for people who really will need it. But if the people that really need it need it, they're going to need it even more mm -hmm. after it piles up for a month or two or whatever your suspension rate is. Are we then going to go back and set up payment plans for those people so that on the back end that they are not stuck on um, trying to pay a large? So, but bill. to be clear, the, the bills will continue to accrue. Their services right. just will not be shut off. Mm -hmm. Right. The right. simple thing would be that we waive all late fees and things like Mr. that. Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. I, I think if you give us a little opportunity to look at some of this stuff, uh, there are some things we probably can do. And, and I, I don't want to jump out and say we can do X, <clears> Y, or Z right now without looking you know, to make sure we can. I don't want to misspeak. So um, if you'll give us a little opportunity, I'll come back to you with some ideas. And did yeah, we, that'd be great. Did we resolve to go beyond seven days? I believe um, your decree last week was for seven days when I said the emails. So, so seven you'll, days you'll, from now. You'll be extending okay. the okay. executive order for be seven days that. from today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. It goes with that. Can I That's just yeah. something that I really want us to consider. Um, and just keeping in mind that a lot of people the spare money that they did have, they have to buy food. Right. They have to buy food for children that are out for two months. I'm one of those people, I know. So <laughs> so children that are going to be out for two months, they have to buy 
quite a cost. bit of food, and it's going to be extremely costly there, for those parents. And there is a program, I'm not totally, totally familiar with you, probably are more familiar with it than I am, Mayor, uh, the um, school program providing breakfast and uh, lunch. lunch for kids. Mm -hmm. So there is one that's going to continue on for the next month. I know that. Mm -hmm. That's with the county? That's planned. Well, I think, I think that that's something, another thing that the city can definitely do that's not a high, probably not a high immediate dollar cost, although it does require labor, is to, um, you know, it, it educate. And, I mean, obviously, it, I mean, you know, citizen outreach is just an education. Is important. I mean, one of the main things we have to combat is not just the virus, but false information or incorrect information about it, about treatments, about cures, about, you know, ways of diagnosing whether you have it. I mean, misinformation is, you know, I'm not going to say as dangerous as the infection, but it certainly can be very damaging. So I think education is very important. And, you know, I think that we need to make sure that we use our, our, you know, our podium as a way of, of educating people, like you're talking about the meals program. Um, you know, I think we should definitely make it a priority to have a single point on our website uh, where we can post links to things like that have an educational thing where people can come and very quickly find out, you know, what are their options for food insecure families? You know, where if people want to donate, where can they go? What can they do? Um, you know, I think it would just be really good to have a clearinghouse like that that's easy to understand um, and answers frequently asked questions, um, you know, that serves as our way of kind of educating people and making sure that it stays up to date, whether it's, you know, PSAs on Facebook and social media, whether it's just, you know, again, a, you know, a very updated website. Um, you know, I think it's very important to, you know, give out up-to-date information and not just, you know, doom and gloom, but, you know, ways of combating it or things that we can do going forward. So I don't know how much of an effort that would take, but I think that's a worthwhile effort because there's not only a lot of misinformation um, and distorted information, but you've got to go to so many different places. And someone who's well-intentioned may just, you know, give up if they can't. You know, we want to make it convenient for people to try to help each other. Mm -hmm. And because I think if, it, if nothing else comes out of this good, it will be the sense that we are going to unite as a community. I think that already we're seeing people start focusing on things that are more important in life. And, uh, you know, being, okay. being focused on, you, bring it up. you know, pulling through this is going to unite us as a community and as a, a country more than I think almost any other event except perhaps 9-11 in my lifetime, is going to cause us to kind of rally. So I want to do whatever we can to encourage that positive momentum. And, you know, I think that using, the, using our reach to educate is very important. So that was the other thing that I wanted to say, is in addition to trying to help small businesses, I, I, there's so much fear and uncertainty and insecurity out there, um, even among people who you think could go get the answers themselves. But I really think it would be important for us to have something official for people to go to to make it very easy. And then I don't know if there's um, areas where there's just not good penetration of information or if there's areas where people are just not getting education. I've had people ask me all kinds of questions. Can they visit their loved ones in nursing homes, things like that? Um, you know, so maybe that's, good, maybe that's a good opportunity for us to do some education. And maybe we can also identify some segments of our community where – um, they may not all be up to date or where we really need to go the extra distance to get the education. And, um, you know, because I see volunteers as a solution to this. You know, if, if we have kids being at home, we're going to need to have activities and things like that. It may be that there's some opportunities for volunteerism in our community or, or you know, some great ideas out there. But we need to let people know the problem exists. So that's my other kind of suggestion or recommendation is in addition to looking at you know, programs that we can have, I think we really need to ramp up our, uh, our education and our outreach uh, to the citizens of Daytona Beach. So I just forwarded an email to Letitia and asked her to share with everybody. This was from the Department of Agriculture. So they have a program called Summer Break Spot, um, and it's free meals for children under the age of 18, and they are uh, activating different counties. Volusia will be activated the week of March 23rd. Okay. So that will get shared um, with everybody. Mm -hmm. for yeah. so. we, we have a lot of information we can provide online mm -hmm. with uh, a lot of these programs, and we'll, we'll continue mm -hmm. to do that. Um, the, 
the uh, we have programs we're doing right now mm -hmm. that a lot of people don't know about, but we've got camps for kids, and we're because of the limitations in number of participants, mm -hmm. we have to be innovative in how we how we hold those camps. Mm -hmm. So we're not right. stopping the camps, but we are, you know choosing teams, so to speak, and be sure that uh, we get all the kids still serviced in, in so, this process. I mean, that's interesting. Well, I think, yeah, just, let's have just a, I mean, a clearing house or something that we can do to get this information out, maybe to work with the news journal or whoever to make sure that this stuff gets out there, you know, and also combating, you know, people, I guess there's a concern about whether what I uh, said of medicine makes it worse. I mean, just things like that. There's all kinds of information out there that we should we should have some vehicle for people to go and get vetted, reliable information from the city. Mm -hmm. You know what I hear when he's talking? I hear, I love my city. Absolutely. Remember we talked about doing an I love my city thing? I don't know if it's, um, I don't want to say Corona Cares or Daytona oh. Dares to care, you know, but somewhere they can look and see all the things that we're providing and, and things that others are providing that we can share with them to make, it, to make this burden a little lighter on our citizens. I see something like that posted um, that you can immediately go to and not have to go through, you know, all the other departments and everything. It's right there on the, on the mm -hmm. front to let them know that we're concerned about them mm -hmm. and their well-being. So yeah, well, whatever we decide yeah, to there's, share. There's literally <laughs> thousands and thousands of pages of this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and every bit of that is important to somebody. Mm -hmm. So I don't it know is, how we're going to... It, it, it is, a, it is a, as one who almost perpetually tries to promote and, 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 and <laughs> share information, sifting through the amount of data that you receive and determining what is most port important to this population or that person. And, and no matter what I send out, it is always important to someone, mm -hmm. but it's a different audience. Uh, but I, I do think our staff does a good job uh, with their social media campaign, but certainly during this season, we're going to be asking that that be pushed to another level and that our website go to another level. Mm -hmm. uh, and because a lot of times people just need to know mm -hmm. and they need to go be able to go, as uh, Commissioner Delgado was saying, to a reliable place where they know that the information is accurate mm -hmm. and something that they can count on because there's a lot of uh, fictitious information spreading because a lot of people, um, quite frankly, for a long time have not, recognize the gravity of this situation. Mm -hmm. In fact, they have, they have thought it not uh, so grave as, and thought it was some sort of conspiracy. Wow. Um, may I yeah. um, speak to this? May I speak to this? Yeah. Okay, so I just got a note from the owners of Cruisin. Thank you so very much. It, the note says, um, we would like to donate 75 kids meals a day for any organization you guys pick as long as we're open. So that is a huge offer because I know there are many um, organizations that are going to be serving, is it 75? I mean, that's a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a lot of kids. So thank you so very much for that. Yes, and I'm you. always going to say Housing Authority, they do a lot. I'm always going to go yes. there first. Um, thank you. We really appreciate, city appreciates that. Um, and I'm about the enforcement part, so I'm curious. We've had people kind of not follow the rules during bike week. How do we make sure they do this? What's well, going to happen? We're going to be out there. Chief is out there. His staff's out, mm -hmm. and, out in and front. And what is the consequence? Just curious. They decide to still serve alcohol, be open. What Bob is the consequence? Told you oh, they can, they, can they can lose their license. That's what I want to know. As well as, it, That's what as I want to know. be subject to um, court penalties, too. Okay. That's... So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Get them. Okay. All right. Anyone else? Um... First of all, um, I want to say um, we are in unprecedented times. Um, certainly, uh, the expectation is that this particular virus is probably the most um, pronounced threat to our public health uh, since 1918. And certainly in my lifetime, there is nothing that we've experienced quite like it. Um, and I do want to address uh, how we arrived at some of the conclusions that we arrived at here recently um, and to say that uh, as the manager stated a little earlier um, 
the most important thing for us, I think, has to be our public health. Um, the American economy um, is important, and it, but it is a resilient, um, I won't refer to it as an institution, but it is a resilient way of life. I believe that it is the most resilient economic system in the history of the world. Uh, it has had a way of uh, rebounding from uh, recessions and depressions um, and every other uh, economic calamity that it has been faced with. And certainly, while this is a health crisis, we are reminded that our health is our greatest resource because the challenge of um, not being able to uh, execute or exercise that health in a public forum, in a public fashion, and the challenge of uh, having perhaps as many as uh, you know a million people faced, or a million or more people uh, faced with this virus, and some are saying that up to a million with different models, we could lose a million people. Uh, and so we, we I, I say all of that to say that uh, the decision that was made on last Friday uh, certainly was the toughest decision that I've had to make uh, in my life uh, and, and, and the toughest decision that I've had to make as mayor of the city. Um, what I will say is that I was a little disappointed because I, I understood the gravity of the situation uh, and I was a little concerned because the last thing that I wanted to transpire was for the old divide to continue to raise its ugly head in our community. That divide of uh, beachside versus uh, mainland and whether or not the beachside is being given some uh, unfair advantage to the mainland. Uh, and so to Commissioner Reed's point, by every mean and by every measure, certainly if we have people who violated the itinerant vending clauses uh, that we revoked that we should do what we can to ensure that they do not have uh, the capacity to do that for at least one year. Uh, so we have to say that this was a serious uh, breach of the public trust, serious breach of the fact that this is not a right. Itinerant vending is not a right in our city. It is a privilege that we afford people because we want to give them an opportunity to make money and to thrive uh, as far as their businesses are concerned. And so the fact that it was not a right was the reason in part that it was because some of the same things that we, that we are ordering now could have been ordered at that same time. They were not ordered. But I felt as mayor of this city uh, that at some point in time when the NBA was closing, canceled or postpone their games. Our very own NASCAR started out saying that they were going to have their sporting events with no spectators. Then they canceled. At some point in time, now if we had known all of that 10 days prior, then we would have revoked and asked the Chamber of Commerce to suspend bike week at a minimum. But we didn't know that. This was a fluid situation. Um, so once those things happened, it was painfully obvious to me that we needed to take a strong step, uh, as strong a step as I thought prudent under the set of circumstances that we could take in that moment to try to discourage large groups from congregating together, therefore attempting to slow the spread of the virus. During the decision-making process, it must be noted that those who advised, including our city manager and city attorney, we all acknowledge that the decision could and would likely have a greater impact on those on Mary McLeod Bethune Boulevard. Because I recognize that they didn't have the uh, building capacity to harbor or hibernate and to execute uh, their businesses as people on Main Street had. They didn't have the amount of property space. Even if you extend down MMB and you go further, you'll notice that if it was on the other end, they have greater, larger lots, larger spaces that they could do things on their property that would enable them, although they are not licensed, hmm. 
to execute in the way that the end that we use is licensed to execute. Um, they would have been more successful and easier for them to execute in the same way that Main Street did, which is all the more reason why we should send a clear message that those who violate it must be held accountable. Mm -hmm. um, now, they acknowledge that the decision was still made to move forward. It was not made lightly because I recognize that our way of life is largely governed by our ability to operate financially, to execute our businesses. Free enterprise in America is something that I take uh, uh, sincerely and I think that our system of uh, capitalism is one that has enabled us to be the successful nation that we are. So stripping that was difficult. However, I also took into consideration the much more important reality that if the virus were to spread in our community, especially Midtown, it would also have a much greater and more devastating impact. The same way that every other scourge in American history has had a disproportionate impact on the African American community, if this virus is allowed to spread, this reality would likely also be more pronounced in 32114 zip code. The same zip code that has this commission and others working hard to bring about a health equity zone. The same community that has myself and other leaders working feverishly to bring about an educational, economic, and health renaissance, something that we met Two weeks ago or three weeks ago, presidents of universities, school superintendent, business leaders, all seeking to take the 32114 zip code and specifically create an economic enclave to try to revitalize that community. So in a time when we must be focused on activities that protect our posterity, activities that protect our children and our elderly and most vulnerable. In an effort to mitigate the crisis for senior citizens and all others, what is certainly the greatest realistic threat of our lifetime, I think that we now have to make certain that if we do nothing else moving forward, that we maintain a unified commitment that we will together fight this scourge because it is the only way that we will come out of it whole and wholesome. So we have to do it together. So when we make these calls, it is only fair that everyone execute according to the plan of action from the governor, the president, from the county, the city, whatever those plans are so that we're all on the same plane and that we all come out of this feeling as though we were one treated fairly, but that we were on the same team. Team Daytona, Team Volusia, Team Florida, Team USA, Team World. One team, because we're in the fight of our lifetimes, period. Thank you. Do we have any other comments from you, Mr. Yes, Manning? Like Anyone else? Uh, Mayor, I'll have this executive mm -hmm. order for you to sign at the conclusion of the meeting. Okay. This meeting is adjourned.